Welcome to the Free Money Podcast. It's where we bring you the Brooklyn Bay Area consensus about institutional investing that you desperately crave. Yes. And I tell you, Sloan, I am coming into this pod blog podcast today feeling a little nervous, Mm -hmm. a little worried, and I'll tell you why. I learned since the last podcast, a, a friend of mine in the investment space informed me that many institutional investors and chief investment officers actually use podcasts now Mm -hmm. to develop and form their key market assumptions, capital market assumptions, which Mm -hmm. for those of you that are learning about the world of investing, investors use these assumptions to power their most important decisions. Yep. They're like underlying stuff. Yeah, exactly. Rebalancing and, um, you know, Pacing models and all those kinds of things come out of the capital market assumptions and the fact that, you know, podcasts. And so I'm nervous that I don't think you, dear listener, should be relying on this podcast alone. The free money uh, compliance officer has gotten to you, Ashley. You know, I'm just sitting <laughs> thinking, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty good, Sloan. But yeah, uh, you know, uh, we, you should have a well diversified and balanced diet of the pod logs. Yeah, uh, exactly. For your key decisions, I believe. Yeah, I mean, or it, like, I mean, if you listen to this podcast, you're basically just going to be, you know, forced to assume that something crazy is going wildly weird in the world of institutional investments basically every week. That's like your default assumption if you're a regular free money listener. Exactly. Exactly. Which, I mean, we have kind of a boondoggle of the week to talk about, right? Or the boondoggle of the now. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Which this bonkers story that, I mean, so first of all, I I learned of the Pennsylvania Treasury uh, account through their just absolutely based Twitter presence, um, where they would post crazy memes about you know, their investment portfolio and stuff like that. It was the best. But <laughs> you were a little closer to that story. <laughs> yeah, I think you may have seen my name in that uh, story. I it was, a, it was a wild project, I have to say. We, um, we led the project. So I was hired mm. by Treasurer Torsella to, uh, to help, you know, do a review and analysis of, of this, the pension systems in, in the state of, or sorry, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania mm-hmm. and see if we could help them improve um, and, and kind of deliver better outcomes for, for everybody. You know, mm-hmm. the, the pension plans, the, you know, the treasury, the, the average citizen. And it was nuts. You know? Yeah, like that led to you like potentially not being allowed back into, or you know, your your <laughs> ability to enter the state of Pennsylvania being threatened. I mean, and you know, confusing it for a Commonwealth and a, you know, getting that mixed oh, up is not helping you crawl back. It's not helping me, is it? That's correct. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I heard through, I heard from some friends that there was there was um, a certain staff member on one of the pension plans that said Ashby wasn't welcome anymore in the Commonwealth. Um, I didn't think my report was that scathing, but, but look, I think, uh, it's, this is a hard space. This is, you know, bringing transparency into these organizations is challenging. And, yep. um, I had, I, I actually really enjoyed what I learned in the project, but it was not partisan, but politicized. It was amazing mm. to see the political, um, kind of calculation going on right from the beginning, you know, and as you see from that article that came out in the Inquirer, like I was being asked about, you know, my background and like trying to figure yeah. out what, what are, are your kind political of, beliefs? Are you, yeah, like, are you affiliated beliefs? with the conservative? Like, <laughs> yeah. Are you uh, one of these Stanford guys that believes in a, you know, risk-free rate as a discount rate? Or are you, you know, a sane human? Um, that like, that was the type of stuff I was being subjected to. But anyway, um, I, I think that the tragedy of it all is, is treasurer Torcello didn't get another term yep. and, and I found him to be like completely practical, um, you know, willing to take on pretty difficult, um, projects to, to kind of do good. Yep. Um, and so he, it's sad because he kind of made me like, feel like politicians were, we're, we're great people that we're trying to just do the right thing. And then he didn't get reelected. <laughs> he got that. He gave you hope. And, and then the public yeah. just stole it away. But, you know, I think the, the, the observation of political versus politicized is really kind of pregnant though. Right. Cause like, 
you know, it's not like it's, you know, coming up in, you know, the way that we were used to politics being nuts. Um, like that, like in the past four years where there was this guy and it was bad and we all talked about it with our therapists. Yeah. Um, you know, this is like just the nature of a conversation is too hard to have in the public sphere. Um, constructively almost, it sounds like, like everybody going into this is like worried about how it's going to look. They're worried about blowback. Um, you know, and you just have this giant problem of how do you get consensus on a very hard issue in the public eye. There's, there's a, a, a deep, what it, what it taught me was there's this deep fear of the slippery slope, which is mm, it, mm-hmm. if you take one step in this direction, where do yep. the steps end? You know, yeah. if, if we raise the fact that hedge funds are charging us too much, does that mean we can't use hedge funds, which means we have to lower our discount rate, which yep. means we need to cut benefits, which means, you know, on and on and on. It's like, Everybody sees a, a move in a, li- a little tiny move in a direction as the beginning of a path to mm-hmm. their, you know, doom. And uh, and I don't know enough about politics to know if that's right. You know, I, I I'm trying to be practical. And so, um, you know, this these these conversations that we had were illuminating. To say I bet. Least. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, I. I feel like in politics, you can never be too careful about somebody freaking out for what you seem to think is or what you think is like not a big deal. Um, this is like a minor administrative thing. Anyway, what's the news? I got some news. You got news. I, oh, we got to have like some kind of a trumpet with the news. News, 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 news. <laughs> <laughs> and the first news story kind of ties into to the the PA commission story, which is, um, I saw some news, uh, that financial performance for American public pension plans. Yep. So that means the returns delivered by financial markets are paying 71 cents of every retiree's pension dollar. So we are only contributing 29 cents of the dollar, and it's, mm-hmm. you know, the hedge funds, the private equity funds, the venture capital funds, all the bad guys, um, in quotes, not really all bad guys. But the, the idea is we really do rely on financial markets to deliver um, this financial performance to have any chance at actually paying these benefits. Yep. Yep. And and so, one, it explains – the thing I think is so interesting about that stat and the what reason I brought it up is it explains why you see, you know, governments around the world continuing to establish sovereign funds and everybody continuing to focus on improving pension fund design. Like these platforms make promises very cheap relative yep. to the absolute cost. Yeah. You know, yep. and, you can yeah. make a big, big promise and it costs 29%. Of what you pay, basically, <laughs> if you I mean, set these up right. 70% off is a great deal. And, you know, I, I think it's an, it brings up an interesting subpoint, which is like, we kind of rag on hedge funds a fair bit um, for kind of being like, you know, jazz hands plus, you yeah, know, a, that's a in the black box. Exposure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just like being like, all right, we're, we're doing a great job. But there is some underlying magic there, right? Like, if you can get, if you can set up some capital to compound, um, that rules. And, you know, there's a, there's a separate issue of like, how efficiently are you doing that and what costs are you incurring? Um, but really cool. Yeah. You know, it, and you're right to like call it out. Like we, we need these organizations to make high returns. And actually that's partly what you sensed palpably in that Pennsylvania project. The, the pension fund managers were like, look, for us to be able to go make all this, <laughs> these returns, we got to keep yeah. this secret in a way, you know, like, like you're going to open up all this stuff and you're going to prevent us from being able to make the returns we need to make in yep. order to pay these pensions. Don't screw this up for us, Ashby, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and my point is like, look, without good governance and like a transparent illustration of the cost of hedge funds and the cost of private equity funds and the cost of your pension fund, how do we know where to, where to pick? Like, yeah, we got to pick one to go make the 71%, Right. So we, yeah. either we're going to invest in you to do it, or we're going to invest in private equity. And and yeah, anyway, we need to get that transparency to allow that to happen. That Yeah, it can't just be some weird thing you do in the dark. Exactly. Right? Like, it, it has to be something that you can de- you can defend and explain. Right. And, and right now, into my second story, Sloan, uh, we have 
organizations like pension funds that are woefully under-resourced. I saw mm-hmm. a report from Mercer, yep. very famous consultancy. Yep. Uh, well, and was. Mercer says that institutional investors today are spending half a day per week just typing up handwritten notes. That's all that I mean they're like half a day a week. <laughs> they are typing up handwritten notes. This is the state That's, of the wait, art. That's insane to me. I'm just trying to think about I'm just trying to put that into practice. So like that's like that's it a senior guy true. goes into a meeting. <laughs> yeah, like, and someone true. senior writes down handwritten notes and then someone else is like out <laughs> And that takes up a tenth of the week. <laughs> yeah, like I think you're capturing a few smoke breaks, maybe, maybe like yep. a quick, quick, like you know, dash off to the bar. But anyway, like the the point is, this was this was Mercer data that I'm telling you, Sloan. So yep. it's got to be right. <laughs> uh, but it, it pretty much sums up the challenge of fixing capitalism for me, because you know we've got these critical actors that are like sitting here with you know um, notebooks writing everything down, and then a huge chunk of their time is literally just copying these notes, according to yeah. the Mercer consultancy. I, I mean, it, you know, we, we roast it, but like the concept of, you know, people being encumbered by lots of paper, I mean, that, that's, I, I, that's I, 10% low in my estimate, you know, yeah. like that, just like things that people, you know, would love to be able to do with information, but can't, um, you know, even in terms of, I mean, like the whole Pennsylvania thing was about, how much are we paying these Wall Street managers? Which is like, right. you know, something that like to most people on the street is an insane question for, you know, to be hard. Like, how could that possibly be a hard question? Exactly. Um, exactly. Know. And so, but I have to say, this is all the work that I'm doing at Stanford around knowledge management. And like, yep. you you could be taking those notes, by the way, onto an iPad and have it yep. auto populate into a note system that the entire organization could see in real time. Like literally, yep. just so that everybody knows that's listening to this, it yep. should take zero minutes to have that. <laughs> and the knowledge <laughs> to have should be linked to itself. It should exactly. be, you, know, you should be able to link across it to like tags and all kinds yeah. of good stuff. Like you should look at your calendar, look at who's in the room with you. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like it should be real time. The fact that people are literally taking, you know, six <laughs> hours a week doing this is crazy. Okay. Final story before we get into the main, the main yep. interview. The main event. The main event, and it has to do with gamification mm. of finance, as gamification. it's pronounced. Isn't finance uh, just a game anyway? Like, well, how so can you that's gamify the a game? That's the question, Sloan. Based on our yeah. last podcast, where we talked yeah. about, you know, the GameStop bananas, yeah. uh, and and our amazing guest who was using option trades as a Yep. felt like game she was <laughs> i mean i would say uh, liz explicitly was playing was was using <laughs> as a game and, <laughs> and she's lovely because she has no pro- trouble whatsoever admitting that and no that was it, it was very clear and, and she's lucky to be a highly paid software engineer that can get away with that That's yeah exactly dabbling dabbling yes game. um and and but there was um the session in congress this week around gamestop oh, which hilariously did not include GameStop there because they didn't even need to be there. Because they were uh, irrelevant to it. They were irrelevant. The very company <laughs> that the title of the session was was not there. Um, but one of the key takeaways was that option trading is hotter than ever. Yep. And that many people see it as a game. Mm-hmm. And it reminded me that Robin Hood, who is one of these key actors in all of this, is currently being sued by um, another commonwealth, I believe, Massachusetts. Yep. Uh, for, um, you know, gamifying investing. And so my question for you, Sloan, coming through all of this is, do games have a role in finance? I mean, yeah, like, we got to get someone on the phone for this. Because, like, Robinhood is, you know, does some gamification stuff, like where it shows you confetti when you buy a stock, right? And that kind of, you know, to some people, smacks of game. But there's there's a much deeper kind of gamification that people can do. Um, let's see. You're making a telephone call to somebody I might know. Yes, indeed. We're uh, we are making a telephone call to one Lindsay Holden, uh, who may know more about using games for finance than almost anyone. I like Lindsay Holden is somebody I know, and um, I'm excited to get her on the phone. Yep, I believe in us.
Hello. Hey, hey. Lindsay. Lindsay Holden. You oh, got- I see him clone. Hi. Oh. This is uh, this is the pseudo live uh, free money part podcast. In that um, we don't want to have to go back and edit this, so so don't swear too much. Uh, but but if you do drop a couple of doozies, we can always go back and change it. Um, yeah. Just swear in an innovative fashion, please. Like the, no no standard curse words. Yeah, just make us look good. Um, look, Lindsay, you are uh, the chief executive officer and, to be candid, my co-founder uh, of Long Game <laughs> Savings Company. Um, and it's a company that uses games to help people make smart decisions. We were just talking about some of the um, gamification of finance that's going on right now within the option markets and what's going on in Congress. Um, and uh, we just want to know, what what is your view? Do, do games have a role in finance? Um, well, I, I'm sure you can tell, you can tell my answer. I run, I run a long game, which is a company that uses games to help people make better financial decisions. So I think there is, there is a a space for it, certainly. And even more, it it should exist. Um, we're trying to use, use games to help people, um, save more, not take more financial risk. So yeah, like how how do games work in this case? Like, I, are you doing more than like the Robin Hood approach of telling people which weekly options to trade um, and showing showering confetti on them when they trade the right ones? <laughs> yeah, so um, long game is built around the concept of prize link savings, and I assume you guys have talked about that in this podcast a little point. bit. But me... but but try to define it. Just to define it for everybody. So prize link savings is a behavioral economics mechanism um, where Instead of giving someone a direct interest rate for their savings, you're giving them a chance to win a, a prize. So like uh, it's been called a lottery savings before. Um, and this is pretty well proven out. Um, and you know there's there's some really huge uh, huge implementations of this, including premium bonds in the UK. Um, but think of, if you want to think about it, I mean, who wouldn't want instead of just getting a couple dollars on their savings account a year? Um, just chances to win um, a, a, a change your life type of prize. And mm-hmm. so in Long Game Today, um, you save money in your savings account and you have access to win up to a million dollars in our app. And you, um, and the more you save, the more chances you get to win. And so like, just to, just to be clear with the PLS front, it, it's, it's um, the savings is always protected, right? So, like what we do with long game, th- there's you know we give you a chance to win a million dollars, but you're never going to lose a dollar that you've saved. Yeah, it's an FDIC link, in, in, you know, deposit account, right? Exactly. Yeah. So we're making a game that goes on top of a of your bank account, and so really, actually, in long game today, you you actually get interest from your bank, and then you're also um, able to win prizes for savings. But traditionally in PLS, it can it can be the interest or just a reduced interest rate um, mechanism. And so this last week, we kind of announced this big launch. Like, t- give like the the listeners a sense for like what was that launch about, um, and and like what is the life cycle that we've had with Long Game over four years? Like, tell us a little bit of the history of the company and where we are now. Yeah, so Long Game started as a direct to consumer app. Um, and the, the vision and mission of the company is really, we wanted to make savings into an enjoyable experience, something that felt, um, emotionally resonant that you wanted to engage with, um, something that you felt like, Hey, this is easy. I'm making progress and this feels great. Um, and we started that with prize link savings as the core mechanism of the app. Um, and then quickly learned that, um, you know, gaming is, is a huge, um, has a, has a lot of behavioral expertise in helping people do things. And so, uh, we built this beautiful interface over at Neobank that allows people to play games, to win, to complete missions, to set goals. Um, and we're really driving amazing consumer behavior, daily check-in, increasing savings by 20% a year. Um, and we started getting interest from the financial services industry, specifically from banks that are you know not traditionally very good at at engaging with their customer, um, and seeing this as like this differentiated thing, 
And so what we've done is uh, we launched Long Game Rewards last week, which is our interface on top of bank products. Um, and so we, uh, we, t- we, t- we basically pivoted the company saying, we're no longer going to provide uh, banking services to our customers. We are going to um, really hone in on our core competencies and let banks do the financial side of this equation. And then we're just going to provide an interface that they can use to engage with their customers. And so we launched Long Game Rewards. We launched it with our two first bank partners, NBKC Bank and Borrow Bank. And today, if you have an account with one of those banks, you can log into Long Game and get rewarded for savings. Which is pretty, I mean, I, you know, full disclosure, uh, I have an inactive Long Game account of my own. Um, and was I actually kind of uninstalled the app because I was too hooked and I kept playing uh, the games a little bit too much. Um, and I was like, all right, this is cool, but uh, I'm seriously, I'm playing like Lotto like 10 minutes a day. That's uh, that's not tenable. Um, you know, like, it, what is it about, like, is saving money like so innately hard that we need to trick ourselves into doing it? And like, how do games like help with that? Well, apparently it's not that hard for you, Sloan, because if you could play for 10 minutes a day, then you must have been saving quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's one minute a day. <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I, and so, yes, I mean, a lot of people have trouble savings. If you look at the numbers, um, you know, 60% of Americans don't have a thousand dollars in savings. Um, and uh, I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that, but um, we live in a, in a society that um, really values uh, immediate reward and um, and you know savings uh, traditionally how it's done. Um, you know you're you're actually delaying reward. So um, really, what we're doing is we're using like you know game game designers and really know how to make you you know do things within an app. And so we're just taking that and we're overlaying it over something that people really um, tr- have have some trouble doing and make it into a really enjoyable experience that's rewarding in the moment. It's interesting to hear you talk about the the games like that because it, it reminds me like these games, you know, when you look at them and you play them, you know, you might think like, oh, these are like fun, kind of engaging, sometimes silly games. And and we did, you know, recruit the superstar guy out of Zynga to come and build all these games. But underneath the games is like super serious, like important technology and even science. Um, you know, we have this coin economy and it, it's, it's meant to be powering a whole set of like behavioral nudges in order to help people kind of make smarter decisions. And so I, I think what I've always been really fascinated with was like, what are some of the learnings from this like coin economy and the games and the prize winning mechanics that, that we've basically helped to invent, um, that, that you think are like most interesting? Um, I, so yes, I mean, so like, well, you know, well, Ashley, that, you know, we have iterated on this app over, you know, billions of data points and honed in on kind of the best way to both, um, reward the coins. So reward financial behaviors and to reward prizes. And so on the coin side, we have, you know, we have reward loops for, um, for engaging daily, for, Savings, of course, that's the primary one um, for direct depositing, for spending on your debit card. We've done a lot around um, kind of how we incent these actions. And and then on the other side, when you spend your coins, there's been a lot of work done around how we distribute prizes. Um, and what we found over time is, um, you know, you do have the potential to win a million dollars in long game today. But um, getting winning smaller, more frequent prizes is really what increases your savings over time. Hmm. And so uh, we've, it, it's, it's, so, it's such a fun project to work on. We also um, have done a lot around kind of messaging and when, and we have these home screen cards that show you that are, have machine learning behind them and they have different content on them and we've optimized them to show you the ones that are going to increase depositing more. Um, so it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it is a science. And and it feels really fun when you're when you're engaging with it. It's I, yeah, I mean, it's a very deep experience, and you know, it has like a, you know, I, I'm interested in the role that aesthetics play in this because obviously, you know, you're serving up uh, targeted messaging with with machine learning, 
you know, with this goal of driving driving deposits. But there's there's also an overall look and feel um, that I think is kind of like, you know, a big obviously a big part of the app, a big part of what people see. And I wonder if that has any anything to do with behavior or if it's just a design choice. Um, yeah, I mean, it certainly does. So there, there's kind of, you know, Ash, when Ashley and I founded Bongi and we we had talked to initial banks and it was a pricing savings at the time was a pretty new idea in the US. And um, and we thought, you know, everyone thought this needs to be like very trustworthy if you're going to be doing these games of chance where you can win a prize. Um, and we started out kind of trying to make Bongi look like a bank. Um, but it had like, you know, these little flip it games and, and some of these games where you could win cash in it. And that and that was pretty good. Um, and we started innovating on some of the games, and we realized the more high like fidelity we got with the design, the more people actually trusted it. And and so we went from having like just a really simple gaming interaction to a daily interaction, and made it like you know super high production, beautiful art. Um, and so that was kind of one area like the you know all of the beautiful art you see in long game today is is you know just part of knowing that we've put a lot into this app and that um it's you know a, a really cool thing um but the other thing is really we, we focus on the gen z and millennial demo and um that demographic has expectations for how they're engaging with their mobile devices so if you think about you know everything's kind of immediately rewarding right at your fingertips um you know you want things to be beautifully designed you know, expect everything to be personalized. Like think about, you know, TikTok news feed or, you know, uh, and, and so we've kind of taken a lot of those elements and brought them into the de- design of long game and created an experience that really resonates with that demographic. Yeah. It, re- it reminds me of like that, um, how, how we had to always balance this, like, um, we want to be fun, but, but not like scary, you know, it has to like exude like, Hey, this is legitimate. We aren't, you know, some, some freaky, um, company and we want to nudge you in the right direction. And so now, now that we're partnered with like other banks that like, you know, uh, they have their own flows that, that, that they're coming in. I think it, it gets even easier to kind of push some of the boundaries on fun because the legitimacy becomes so obvious. It's like we're partnered with, with all these legitimate folks. Um, one of the things that came up in our, um, all hands today lens that I thought was astounding was, the app is directing, you know, when you play your game, it's like you get go through this onboarding flow and then you play your game. And when you run out of coins, 90% of the people that run out of coins click on the save more button. Um, you know, people are like, I'm out of coins. I need to save more money. Um, and so that's not a question, Liz. That's a comment. And then one more comment um, on the note cards. Um, I've been pushing quite hard, Sloan, for your benefit, to be allowed to just write jokes on the note cards. <laughs> Um, uh, and so I'm still, it doesn't sound like you at all. I know. And so I'm just, you know, putting it out there into the vibe. Um, for those of you that want to hear Ashby's jokes on the note cards, just write to Lindsay at longgame.co. Um, and I'll, <laughs> anyway, those, those are just a couple comments for you. Back to you, Sloan. <laughs> you guys have such a, a productive and healthy working relationship. It's really just a joy to see. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, what, like we we're talking, I think it's really interesting that you went to a place of of, of trust uh, when you were talking about the design elements, and um, you know, in part because like the you know we've had a couple of apps, fin- other finance apps that you know kind of in my in my subjective view rank low on the trust quotient, right? Like, I mean, uh, I'm talking about you know Robinhood, which was obviously in the news. We did a whole episode about it. But also like all the weird crypto apps, like, you know, I have an account on some crypto uh, exchange that's like based in Taiwan and it moves its jurisdiction around. There's absolutely no guarantee. Sometimes I can log in, sometimes I can't. You know, I mean, the it's a lot of those consumer facing finance, finance apps have seen like I don't, what people have characterized as a gambling driven loop, um, like playing out with stimulus dollars where people are like, you know, I got you know, my $600 check, you know, what, what crazy YOLO bet should I take? How, how is that sort of, uh, you know, that's that flow of dollars, that flow of interest played out with long game? I'm so sorry. I was just, uh, muted okay. <laughs> and talking to you. These things happen. Um, so, uh, how did, how did the flow of dollars, um, flow out with long game? So today the way it works is, um, 
you know, you, 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 you link a bank account to log in. Um, and so that is the account that you're saving in. You're working with that bank to, you know, save or spend on their debit card. And, um, and then when you win a prize in long game, it just gets ACH deposited into that account. Um, so it's, I, it's really fun, like to see all the little deposits coming into that account. That's kind of, that's a new thing. Since, you know, this is a pretty new product that Ashby and I were kind of having fun with. Um, so I get a bunch of notifications, but, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's how we're, the flow of funds is, is working today. Lindsay, I think one of the things that I miss are the crypto rewards in the new product. Are we ever going to get back? First of all, are we going to get back to the crypto rewards and are we going to get back to the turtle racing uh, for those long-term long game fans? Because <laughs> um, I do miss the turtle racing. And that's your last question. And then we're going to let you go. But those are the two. Yeah, I want my two, turtle races. <laughs> we want our turtle races and we want our crypto spin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I, I don't know where turtle racing went. We have to bring that back immediately. Um, <laughs> that was a really and Rochambeau. Fun what happened to Rochambeau? There's, that was fun. Th- yeah. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of, uh, internal decision making happening with turtle racer though. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, so yeah, uh, with the crypto rewards, yes, crypto rewards by popular demand are coming back. We are working on it right now. It's going to be Amazing. back in your app in the next couple of weeks. Um, but uh, and so, just to be clear for anyone listening, um, crypto rewards are you can play our games and win um, Ethereum or Bitcoin. Uh, and um, that was something that we had experimented with in the consumer app, and uh, people really loved it. Um, it's a fun way to get exposed to crypto if you're not going to set up an account with one of these shady uh, apps that. <laughs> That's one we're just referencing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so yeah, let's look up Dora one. Coming back soon. Awesome. Lynn, thank Bella, you for... sounds sick. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And, yeah. and the crypto keeps going up. It's so insane. This, it's it's going to be good. Yeah. Um, Lindsay, thank you so much for taking half an hour on a Friday to chat with us. Yeah, and, thank and you, talk about the game. Thank, thank you for having me, you guys. All right, All right. talk soon. Talk to you soon. Talk Bye. Soon. Bye. That's, I, you know, honestly, you can tell that she works on an app that's targeted at, you know, Gen Z and millennials when she goes, we live in a society, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is like a- absolutely the perfect comment for the modern era. I know we do. Know. We do. We live in a society. We live in a society. It's, <laughs> it's, it yeah. can be too much sometimes. Yeah. The question I didn't ask her is like, how easy is it to run a tech co- company in, uh, in COVID? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that would be a longer uh podcast but it is yeah, uh sh- sh- you know the the new amp the new app just launched and it's so fun um henry my son and i have been playing it every morning and i have to say like i'm legitimately frustrated with him when he plays all my coins i want to mm. you know they talk about the coin economy like i'm like where did my coins go i'm working on some like pretty cool stuff here because some of the games now you can play over time anyway Oh, that's really cool. And yeah. Henry's like out here hogging like the potential access to Turtle Racer. Exactly. Um, that's uh, that's that's got to be hard. I mean, watching your kids play games instead of you is like probably one of the hardest parts of parenting. Exactly. It's really difficult for me. Yeah. Yeah. But if that's difficult for you, you know, it's really going to be difficult for you. <laughs> <laughs> the Dear Ashby segment of the show. It's going to be crazy. Uh, <laughs> Here we are. Where basically, uh, hey, this is, you know, just a quick pause for self-promo. Um, we, we stopped begging for ratings in the App Store, and, and that was dumb. We really should have never stopped doing that because we got some great ratings on the podcast store. Please um, give us some, a rating. Yeah. Some very nice comments that people had. Um, please, please, please. We, we, we do crave your acceptance and uh, and positive affirmation. We um, actually also, just, we just need it. We really we do need it. it. It's really, I mean, you know, we start off saying that you desperately crave this, but it's actually for us. <laughs> exactly. um, the, um, what was the other thing? Oh yeah. If you uh, want to ask Ashby a question, just, you know, write, you know, to free money at gmail.com and we will ask your question in this segment of the show. Um, the first question is, I, I don't know, like maybe someone hoping that you'll choose them. Who would be your, free, your dream guest on free money? I think um, the person who asks that question, 
uh, <laughs> is my dream guest. No, um, my dream guest would probably be any of the presidents of the United States of America. And I'm not referring to that classic band from the 90s. Mm. Um, I am really just referring to the president. You know, I, I think, yep. um, you know, these, these, these are the types of people that can have huge influence over all the things that we're trying to influence. And so mm. it would be fantastic to have um, President Biden on or even any, of the, even any of the other. I would talk to, you know, former President Trump about um, why he thinks the election was stolen. And, and you know, that would be pretty wild. Get the message out about free money. But mostly yep. I want to talk to Biden about, yep. um, you know, what he's working on and, and how we can help. Yeah. I mean, it, that, like, that's, a, you know, it's funny. I should have thought about this. You know, I knew this question was coming, obviously, and I should have <laughs> given it a moment of thought before I, <laughs> I asked you. That's but too yeah. much prep. That's too much yes. prep. So that's not <laughs> how we mean, roll. We'll do it live. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like, uh, honestly, President Biden, you know, is it's it's weird, like, how much I haven't thought about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, after, yeah, just, you know. Somebody was so like, long. oh, what do you think of secretary? And I don't even remember who it is now. And I was like, what department are they running? Because it's like, I haven't been close enough to it. I've been too busy. Yeah, exactly. I've been like actually out here living my life. And, and not like, Instead of like completely focused on every single person in the administration, which we've yeah, exactly. been doing for four years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like this, you know, this intern is like, you know, bre brewing a secret plan with the Jewish space laser. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, I mean, Biden would be pretty great. I, you know, we could, t you know, follow the example of of the Red Scare, you know, and, and have Steve Bannon on the podcast as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, although he's, he's less relevant these days. Um, he wears thanks. too many shirts. Um, <laughs> Sure. It's enough. like, all right, all right, Steve. So, like, how many? How, how, how many? many shirt, talk? How many collared shirts do you have on today? Yeah, more exactly. than one. And, and then undershirts also. Like, I, what's the <laughs> what's the top of the iceberg? What's the bottom of the iceberg? He's actually um, only about 140 pounds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of fact. Yeah, yeah. He's just, he's just a number of children stacked on top of each other, wrapped together with shirts. Um, <laughs> so, uh, this one is actually, I, I think this is kind of a, a really good question. Um, lots of companies seem to be adding Bitcoin to their investment portfolios. And mm. I mean, and you know, this question really should say treasury, por treasury portfolios, because that, that's, that's what right. they're doing. It's not, yeah. it's not like long-term investment holdings. It's like, of we're going to take all of our cash and we're going to consider bi Bitcoin a type of cash. Right. Um, should pensions follow suit with that? <sighs> At a certain point. At a certain point, they won't be able to ignore it. But the the interesting thing about this question is I actually think companies holding crypto takes the heat off of them because, because, because um, they own the companies, right? And, mm. and so you can think of this as like if, if as a shareholder in Tesla, um, yes, you own the production function that creates these neat cars and roofs and everything else, but you now own a little bit of Bitcoin. And so I can imagine a lot of pension funds and sovereign funds feeling like this is taking the pressure off of saying, you know, do we need to go out and actually own it? Mm -hmm. Well, no, maybe not. Maybe we'll just let the companies that are going to use it build their yeah. treasuries up with it. And, um, and then, you know, that's a, that's a way of having that exposure without actually having to go out and build the capability to get the exposure. Yep. Do all the crazy, I mean, you know, it's interesting, like Bitcoin as a financial asset is really kind of this beautiful thing, you know, cause it's so volatile. Um, and if you have any kind of rebalancing strategy, you know, and you have like a teeny exposure to Bitcoin that you trim and add to, um, over time, I mean, like that's, that seems like it is a potentially sweet return generator. Yeah, it would be pretty interesting to see like people who have tight um, asset allocation exposures to Bitcoin, how fast they are having to rebalance, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, didn't we have a 6% move today or something? Like, Yeah, well, like actually, uh, so Claire and I like forgot we had some, bit we had bought some Bitcoin for some reason a couple of months ago. And like, I, I think it was like 95 bucks or a hundred bucks or something like that, that we had li lying around in crypto. Lo and behold, today we have literally six hundred dollars. Holy cow! Because <laughs> uh, we were just like, "Oh wow, cool!" I, we should probably sell it at, at some point. Uh, <laughs> that ha that happened. To, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this, uh, but I'll just talk about it. 
we we had purchased some Bitcoin at Long Game for the crypto rewards because oh. we were like, oh, well, we're going to like give people crypto. Of and so we should own some just in case the price goes up, just like all these other companies now thinking, right? Like we yep. were one of these comp- companies that had to create a little bit of a treasury yep. of Bitcoin. And like, it's almost like we got a funding round, you know? It's, yeah, it's I like bet. You look at it and you're like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, can we sell some of that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it really is. It's like, Jesus, this is Do we have to give that to people or can we? That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, it's as if like... You know, the, the currency that you're holding just went through the roof. Um, like I remember when I moved to Europe after living in the US, um, the US dollar like strengthened incredibly. And I, it was just this amazing, you know, free money. This is a fucking podcast about free yeah. money. We're, t- we're just t- giving you lots of tips here. That's true. And, and honestly, it's really amazing that we haven't done like a Bitcoin episode yet as I think about it. I know. We really should get somebody uh, who really, really knows, that. really yeah. knows Bitcoin. Yeah. It, yeah. All right. That's, noted. We, we need to do, do that. Um, <laughs> the next question, last question of, of, of this episode is how can I tell if a robo advisor is good at managing money? I love this question. Um, I love this right? question. Yep. Okay. First, let's understand what the robo advisor is betting on. Okay. Uh, is it some black box mathematical algorithm that's going to go and harvest tax losses while picking, uh, you know, AI based small cap companies in yep, Australia? Yep. We're going to do do so many things. We're going to we're going to do we're gonna take your money. We're going to do so many things with it. It's, it's going to be so amazing. It. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. It's all upside. One hundred percent options on GameStop. No, but but I think like the reality is when you when you look at these things, you got to understand the diversification, and and obviously like everybody would say you have to look at past performance, but unfortunately, as we all know, at least that's what we teach, past performance isn't a good indicator of future performance, but nothing is a good indicator, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. especially in public markets. In private markets, there's a bit of more correlation there between past and future. In public markets, like, in fact, the data will show you future is almost anti-correlated. If you did great, if you were a mutual fund that did great one year, yep, yep. you're almost certainly not doing great five years from now. Especially, the, I think the three-year horizon is actually super well borne out in the, in the yeah. literature. <laughs> like, like I, I, you should almost, like, the minute your mutual fund does well, you should sell it. So, yeah. Um, so anyways, the point of saying all that is like, if you're doing one of these algos or one of these robos that has kind of an, a niche thing, you should think of it like a company. You know, you need to understand it a little bit and you should diversify. You can't just do one robo. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to have a diversified portfolio of these robos that are out, you know, and I almost think of like what I'm describing now is what we called liquid alts. Do you remember mm-hmm. that whole world? Liquid alternatives um, where, you know, it was like, enhanced beta meet met, meeting algorithmic trading in an ETF, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so getting in and understanding what the bet is and then figuring out if that bet is the kind of thing that should be diversified. Um, that's what I would do to like go and figure out, do I like it? Obviously you would look at past performance and think to yourself, does that past performance have any chance of carrying on into the future? If it's like the algorithm has been about, you know, making money from coal, then it's pretty easy to think that it's not going to make as much money in the future. And so those are the types of things, thought processes that like any good fund manager would go through. And the neat thing about these robo advisors is it's like individuals picking funds. You know, it's like our, it's like our experience to play like a pension fund capital (laughs) allocator. You know, yeah, it, well, you know, and, and it, the robo advisor category is super interesting too. Just as a as a note, because they have like you know the on one end you have the like the Vanguard advisor portfolios and stuff that just give you like um, basically a target date fund um, type exposure, and then you have like the the super niche things that are doing like structured settlements and all kinds of stuff like that, where it is basically a hedge fund on the internet. Um, yeah, that's right. You know. Which is, which is really, I mean, it, it's pretty cool that you can do all that stuff in that level of detail. Um, you know what? I should ask a, a pretty simple question. What the hell is a robo-advisor these days? Is it wealth, yeah, like, it, is it Wealthfront and Betterment or is it like a specific? That's what I think of. That's I, like, I go to, ro- I go to that as a robo, but like, honestly, if you're, if you're at, yeah, if you're that's selecting like a, assets, yeah. you know, 
and giving detail on the methodology, I think you're kind of a robo-advisor, right? Yeah. Yeah. For those of you following at home, this isn't how you're supposed to answer questions. You're supposed to ask clarifying, <laughs> clarifying questions up front before you give a long-winded answer. No, um, but like, it, it's, it's kind of like, is SoFi <laughs> picking out loans for you? Is that a robo-advisor? I, mean, I like, think it is. The, isn't it? Yeah. There's, some, there's something very right. similar in, term, in the process there. And so you could have like multiple robo products, I would imagine. Like you could have SoFi doing the loans and then you could have like one of these housing ones finding you, you know, real estate. Mm-hmm. And then, and so yep. you've got all these like things that are offering you some kind of diversified exposure, but the mm-hmm. algorithms, you need to understand what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and then finding some diversification across them and looking at past performance. It's great. It, you know, it's actually a really good question. Um, yeah. So. It's, it's, it's very like, you know, it's like a, a sort of Zen uh, koan, you know, like um, where, you know, where they're like, how, you know, how is chair not chair? You know, when is a chair not a chair? <laughs> yeah. um, how do I know that I'm doing anything of value? Yeah, um, that's right. I mean, my initial thought was low fees. That was like, yep. <laughs> which has the lowest fees, i I'll be honest. Yeah. But I, I mean, <clears throat> my, mine is like, which gives you the most crypto and lets you race the most turtles. Oh, there you go, Swan. <laughs> it's it's really it's this is this is the value added insight that institutional fund managers all around the world are listening to the Free Play Podcast for, oh. and basing their decisions on. <laughs> yes, this is the kind of capital market assumption I'm talking about. I'm not nervous yeah. anymore. Go all in. <laughs> go all in on the it's turtle turtles racing. all the way up, baby, <laughs> and <laughs> joke cards coming to a yep. coming to a finance app near you. Joke cards. Uh, Bye. Bye. I'm looking like money, 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 money,